Well, welcome everyone. Happy New Year. Welcome to the series Mud Talks, Just Culture Management Lessons from the Aviation Industry with Peter Temesferi, class of 89. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations, and we thank you for attending today's event, and we hope you and your family are well. This talk is being recorded and will be distributed after the event. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Now, to briefly introduce our speaker, Peter majored in engineering during his time at MUD and obtained a master's of science in environmental engineering from Cornell. He is a Bates alum and an instrument rated private pilot. Currently, he is the safety manager of the Budapest International Airport. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to our speaker. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vanessa, and welcome everybody. Uh, and thank you for so many people for coming out at noon and Pacific time, I I'm really pleased. And I just had a scan through the, the participants and wow, Mrs. Critchell's here and Barb Filkins. So that's super honored to have both of you, my instructors at Bates program to be here and joining us today. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. And thanks Vanessa again. Uh, welcome everybody. So today, I just a, a few more words of introduction. I, I started out after Cornell, I went into environmental engineering and and did soil and groundwater remediation for about 10, 12 years, and then slowly went into more of the health and safety line. As, as many of you know, EHS is together, environment and safety are, are parallel um, professions. <clears throat> and I got more and more interested in, in the safety and behavioral sciences and, and human error and things like that. And then about eight years ago, I moved to Hungary about 20 years ago, and about eight years ago, I got a chance to become the safety manager at the Budapest airport. And since I grew up flying, I've been flying since I was a wee lad with my father. And, and this was just a fantastic opportunity to merge the personal and professional interests. And I had seen for so many years how an airport works from the user's side, from the pilot's side. And now I'm, I see it from the operator's side. It's very interesting merge. Let me share my screen and let's get into the topic today. There we go. And as, as Vanessa mentioned, the title of the talk is Management Lessons from the Aviation Industry and specifically the concept of just culture, which is, is something that really permeates the commercial aviation industry. Uh, and some other industries. And, and I'd like to just walk you through what this all means and how it can be, an, uh, be applied. Some stories of trials and tribulations from my own career of studying this for the past 15 years and then trying to implement it in real time, as I mentioned, for the past eight. Just one more quick word of introduction. Let me go here, excuse me. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so this is my, my plane and my two favorite co-pilots. Unfortunately, I don't get to fly the airplane that much because I'm in Hungary, the airplane is in Houston, but uh, about once a year though, I, I do get to fly. And, and then just a word of introduction about the airport. So this is a um, satellite view of Budapest airport. It's roughly, um, it's a medium sized airport, roughly the same as say Ontario, San Jose, uh, Edinburgh, uh, or Nice, France, some of these, it's a medium sized airport. So on a good year, let's say pre-COVID pre obviously, about 15 million passengers a year and roughly 100,000 aircraft movements a year. And one of the big challenges in safety and safety culture at an airport is that's different from, let's say, a factory where you have one, one company doing one thing. Here, the, we have, so the Budapest airport, the airport operator has about 1,000 employees, but there's 10,000 people with airport badges which means we're responsible for maintaining and creating a culture of safety with 9,000 other people who are not our own employees. And that's, that's an interesting challenge, especially when it comes to, to just culture. Let me start off with just one, one bit of statistics. And as Mark Twain said, I, the only statistics I believe are the ones I man manipulated myself. But let me give you one, one thought here. If we look at commercial air travel going back to, let's say the 60s, you can see this tremendous, and this is not a linear figure, this tremendous boom in the number of people flying around the world. Before COVID, it was over four and a half billion people a year who were flying. 
And then if you pair that with the number of fatal accidents, so in the 60s, 70s, even 80s, it was in the hundreds of deaths per, per million passengers. And in recent years, it's, it's approached zero, and which is a phenomenal change. So you look at a, a two orders of magnitude increase in the, in the number of passengers and two orders of magnitude decrease in the number of fatal accidents. And it's an amazing, uh, amazing achievement. Now, a lot of this, of course, is due to better technology, better procedures, better training, so on, a lot more safety nets, automation, so on and so forth. But I believe a big part of it is due to an improvement in the culture and the safety culture and, and the concept of just culture. And just culture is something, I'll come to the definition in a minute, but let me just, just show the different aspects of the, of, the, of the industry. So it's something that's been very, very prevalent for the past 30, 40 years in the cockpit, in the airlines. And it's, it's really part of their culture. Also in air traffic control, certainly for the past 20, probably 30 years in air traffic control, as well as in maintenance. And these are things that all add to the improvements in these areas, all add to the safety of, of flight. Unfortunately, I have to say, and this is my industry, the airport side, well, we're behind at least a decade or two. And it's, uh, there's many reasons for it. One of the ones, as I mentioned, is you're trying to control a far more, I'm not going to say complex, but, but a more intricate interwoven group of people and companies. And, and it's more difficult to, to control that. Now, just culture, this is kind of my favorite picture. I think this is what we're trying to avoid if we're trying to build a good safety culture. If you recall from your childhood, what was your biggest fear? Someone saying, oh, you're busted. And then you sweep things under the rug because you don't want to be discovered. Well, this is what we'd like to avoid. And this is what we, we want to create a culture where people can be brave enough and can speak up and say, I did something wrong. I think there's a problem here. I think we should do something differently. I think there's a risk and they're not going to try and hide the errors because we have to recognize that if the errors are hidden, we can't fix them and we're not gonna be able to prevent the accidents. Now let's look at a, a few definitions just quickly. One definition, we just blame whoever did it. Uh, of course, this is a joke. This is exactly not the type of culture we want to achieve. Let's look at a proper, proper definition. And I would start with Professor James Reason, who is, he's a professor at Manchester University and many in our safety profession consider him to be the, the guru of, of human error and, and human behavior. And his definition is the following. It's creating an atmosphere of trust. So people have to trust the system. They have to trust their boss that if they say something, if they speak up, they're not gonna get banged on the head. But Professor Reason also adds that we also have to draw a clear line between what's acceptable and not acceptable behavior, because if it's unacceptable behavior, then that has consequences. And so this is, this is a very, very fine line of where you, where you draw that. Let's take a look at the IKO. So this is the, the organization that UN organization that basically governs all of civil aviation across the world. So they say what we have to look for is if someone makes a, a mistake or makes a poor decision, but anyone with the same training or experience could have made the same mistake, then we can't really hold them responsible. Then there's probably something wrong with the system itself. Another definition from a different industry from the American Nursing Association, they actually declare that errors or reported events or problems are opportunities, which is, which is a very, very positive definition. And here they say, a little bit similar to IKO, is that you have to define what's deliberate and malicious and what's not, what's an honest mistake, in other words. And final definition, the FAA, so the Federal Aviation Administration, they say that if you essentially throw yourself under the bus, then that's indicative of a constructive attitude. And it's saying that if someone comes up and is willing to say they see a problem, then they're gonna be part of the solution. They're willing to be part of the solution. Okay, so these are the definitions. As I, I mentioned, I've been studying this concept for, for many, many years, and I've come up with, I believe, four key elements that you must have in order to develop a good safety culture and a strong, just culture. 
And again, just to define, just means fair in this in this sense. So uh, a culture where people know they'll be treated fairly, even if they make a mistake or make a bad decision. So four elements. Number one, which I will put as zero, so it's even before number one, is you have to have a declared policy. You have to have your management on board, just like any management system, and you have to be it has to be very clear what the company's policy is. Then the other thing that you must have is a strong hazard and incident reporting system. You've got to be able to give people a way to report problems. And I'll go into some examples of each of these, but let's just go through the list quickly. Probably the most difficult part is overcoming society's expectations. And this is, this is a, a very, very, very big hurdle. And then the last element is there needs to be some sort of a committee when if something goes wrong, it's not up to one individual to make a decision on what happens, but it's, it's an informed decision and a, a joint decision of, of uh, several people. And I'll go into some examples of these. Okay, let's start with number one. I only have one, one slide here, just, just some thoughts on different policies that I found. And you can find, so there, let me grab my pointer here. So this, this, for example, is ours at Budapest Airport. There's a, an air traffic control example, power generation, healthcare. You can find it from a variety of industries. I even found it from, say, forestry industry in Australia, of all places. And I think a lot of companies are, are, are trying to declare that and put it really in their, in their foremost policy that, that they want to treat their workers fairly and they, in exchange, they want to get information from them. That's all about, about policies. It's really, really number zero and the most important and the starting point, perhaps. Maybe not the most important, but the starting point. Now, in terms of reporting, I'd like to, to mention, and the pilots in the group, of course, know this very well, this ASRS. I think this is the, the pinnacle, the gold standard of reporting systems. So what the FAA recognized back in the 70s is they said, we can't, if we're going to punish people, it's just going to backfire. We need information and we want to make sure that people are going to give us information. And so the first thing they did when they set up this aviation safety reporting system is they said, we're going to separate it from the regulatory. We're going to give it to an independent organization. And in this case, it's NASA. And NASA, of course, is a government body, but it's not a regulator. They have no regulatory authority. So if you submit a report in ASRS, it goes to NASA. It doesn't go to the Federal Aviation Administration. And NASA will take your name off of the report. They do all sorts of huge number crunching. This is, I don't know, probably in the order since in the last 40 years, hundreds of millions of reports. And, and then they report to FAA the actual problems and the trends and, and not without actually revealing the name. And this is FAA's declared policy. So as I mentioned in, in the definition, they consider a report to be indicative of a constructive attitude. And they go on to say, and this is very important, if you, you speak up and you say, I made a mistake, I broke a rule, and you reported it, they cannot go after you and can't take away your certificate or penalize you. Of course, there are certain conditions to this, but this is the basic principle. And I think this is a very, very strong system where you can be free to report, even if you, if you um, broke an altitude, you taxied on the wrong runway, you did whatever, something wrong. If you report it, they can't come after you. Now, as pilots, we call this the get out of jail free card and we keep it in our pockets. And it's one of those things that if you make a mistake, you report it as soon as you can and you keep a copy of that report. I actually will admit I do have a couple of those filed away from many, many years ago. I've never had to use them, fortunately. Okay, so reporting is important. What else is important in reporting? Because we want to get people to, to tell us about their problems. One is anonymous. And this is a very, very, very important element of aviation safety is giving people the chance to make an anonymous report. If they don't want to say who they are because they're afraid their boss, their coworker, someone is going to come down on them if they if it if it turns out that they reported something, then give them the chance to do that. And this is our reporting form from from Budapest Airport. So it's important to be able to make 
anonymous reports. Another very, very important thing is to make sure that reporting doesn't cause administrative headaches. <clears throat> now, I have a story from one of my colleagues, and she's, to me, one of my most respected uh, safety colleagues. And she works in the healthcare industry. And she told me once the story of, of one of her colleagues was doing work on a, on a CT. They were doing an installation or a repair and he cut his hand. And she had this big dilemma. She said, if I report this, it's a re required report under our corporate rules. But if I report it, it's gonna cause me a week of time. Corporate's gonna be after me. They're gonna ask me to fill out a hundred reports. I'm gonna spend a week my colleagues are going to spend a week on this and it's for nothing. The guy just cut his hand. It's not a big deal. And if this is the culture of reporting, where as soon as you report any small problem, you're going to be, you're going to be hit with all sorts of administrative headaches, people aren't going to report. So it's something to be aware of. Another trap is mandatory reporting quotas. Now, another story I have here comes from the oil and gas industry. I was talking to, to a colleague once who was working on one of these drill rigs, and it was one of the big, the big oil and gas companies, and they had a requirement. Everybody must submit one observation, one safety ob observation every day. And he said, well, I went in, logged onto my laptop, and I got the report one morning that, oh, the seagull flew from north to south over my head and it was dangerous. And he thought, what? And the next morning he got the report, oh, the seagull flew from south to north over my head. And he, he just threw up his hands and he said, this is ridiculous. Expecting people to report way too much is just, it, it's, it's uh, just shooting yourself in the foot. There's no way you can manage that. So again, a couple of traps with reporting, and, and I think many multinationals, they go overboard on these things, on just too many expectations and too much administration and, and very, very onerous investigations, and it discourages people from reporting. So what is our challenge? Our challenge is, first challenge is inadequate reporting, and what are some of our solutions? One is, and this is very difficult to implement, but the FAA has done it, in the EU, mm, they haven't done it, no penalization of self-reported errors. So if you make a mistake and you fess up, then they shouldn't penalize you. The company shouldn't penalize you. Make sure there's an opportunity for anonymous reporting. Don't make an undue burden for minor events and set realistic targets. And one, one other thing is publish positive results. I think that's very important. And one of the things that I try to publish every year is at the airport is, is how quickly and how many of the hazards we, we have succeeded in resolving. So we have annually about 93, 94% of reported hazards we fixed. And I think that's a great message to, to give to your staff, to give to people say, hey, you guys tell us about a problem, chances are very good, we're gonna fix it. And we also, we also publish things like how quickly they get fixed um, so average time to fix, average time to, to respond to, to issues. We keep track of all of those things. And they make good messages. And I think it encourages people to report. Because if there's a problem and they see that it gets dealt with, that's very positive for them. Okay, so we have a reasonably good definition. We've got a good reporting system. We're halfway there, right? Got some great ideas. Well... Here's the bad news. This is where it starts to get really hard. And this is what I mentioned, society's expectations. Let's start with the semantics, with the definition. So just, fair, does not equal justice in the common everyday language. Think about it. Someone crashes into your car and you say, what's the common slang? I want justice served. That doesn't mean I want that person to be treated fairly and I want to find out why he crashed into my car. That means I want him thrown in jail and I want that judge to come down hard, right? That's our society. And that is very, very much against what we're trying to build within a company or an organization or an industry structure, unfortunately. And this is a very, very difficult hurdle to overcome. And similar to this, is the criminalization of errors. So you make a mistake, you, 
accidentally look and you make a left turn where you shouldn't have, anybody could have done it. There was no traffic coming, uh, but the policeman's there. He doesn't care why you made that mistake. You made a mistake, you broke the law, you're gonna pay, right? So simple errors get criminalized. And then there's another problem we have. Even our best people are gonna make mistakes. All of us make mistakes, dozens of them every day, right? And what do you do when your best person makes a really bad mistake, makes a bad calculation, puts the wire in the wrong place in the, in the switch box? Well, are you gonna treat them the same way as you would treat a junior person or a contractor? Hmm? Very, very difficult questions to ask because of course, if you want a just system, if you want a fair system, everybody has to be treated fairly. So you have to think as you're developing your culture and your procedures, you have to think, what happens if my best guy walks into this trap? How am I going to treat him or her? And then there's another problem with society. <clears throat> now, I, actually, it's great speaking to an American audience because I don't have to explain what football is, right? We all heard this, at least all of the boys certainly did. No blood, no foul. Come on, get off the ground. Nobody's bleeding. Keep playing. Which the problem here is it implies that it's the result that's the problem and not the intent. So even if I trip up one of my teammates and throw them on the ground, I had malicious intent, nothing happened. He's not bleeding, he didn't break his arm. Keep, get up and place as the coach, right? Well, again, this is one of things that are ingrained in us in our society. And they're very much against uh, a concept of a fair or a just culture. And finally, there's the hierarchy gradient. And if you examine aviation accidents, industrial accidents, all sorts of all sorts of accidents, so often when if it's a good investigation report and you go into the details, so often there is somebody there who knew something was going wrong, who knew a rule wasn't being followed, who knew that it was improvisation, who knew that someone wasn't doing something right, and they didn't dare to speak up. And again, it's just the way we're raised. Nobody wants to be the sissy. Nobody wants to say, hey, I don't think that's safe when everybody else is saying, let's get the job done. Let's go, let's go, let's go, right? And you see this, I just picked this because uh, I think it's very indicative. There's a, a young lady who's the co-pilot. Is she allowed to speak up or not? In many, many cultures, you see that probably not. In better airlines, of course, they can speak up and they're, they're very free to, to speak up and say, hey, captain, something's wrong here but in many of them, they're not. And, it, and I think it's even, even worse, if I can say that, in most industries. So the junior person probably isn't really, doesn't feel empowered to speak up. Well, oh boy, how do we solve all of these things? Lots of head scratching, right? How can we determine where, where those lines are? What is commensurate with experience and training? What is deliberate? What's not? What's intended? What's not? Again, our main challenge is, I think our main challenge, if I just take the criminalization of errors as one of the, the indicative societal problems or challenges. One of the things I think very, very important, and this is something I really try to stress with my management and my company, is that to look out for system errors, which, which means someone makes a mistake, but you have to go back and make sure that you haven't set the banana peel under their foot because maybe it was a, so they weren't trained properly, they didn't have the right experience, maybe it was, it was conflicting interests, conflicting priorities, it couldn't be a lot of things that the management did that caused that person to make the mistake or the poor judgment. The other is focus on the intent, not the result. Again, no blood, no foul. That's not a good model for, for just culture. Uh, just a quick aside, we're just in the middle right now of a, of a deliberation. There was a traffic accident earlier in the week at the airport. And, and um, well, one of the people was speeding. And it's the question of, well, if they, we wouldn't have noticed they were speeding if they wouldn't have had the accident, right? So if we focus too much on the, on the result, that's not good. We have to focus on the intent and the, the poor decision that was made that got to the result. Very, very difficult, causes a lot of deliber deliberation. 
One of the tools I've found, and I think this is useful, is, is have a system of small penalties. So someone makes a mistake, you give them a small penalty, you know, effectively a slap on the wrist or, or, or some, something. Maybe if you have a, a point system, then, then a, a small uh, number of points, because it indicates that, hey, we know you made a mistake, you did something wrong, pay up, sit up and pay attention. And, and for the most part, 95% of the time, they're going to say, yeah, you know what, I, I messed up, I deserve that. And that gets them thinking, and it doesn't, it doesn't create a, a, a huge discomfort or, or antagonism in them. So this is, this is a tool that, that is potentially useful. The other tool that we found useful is to temporarily suspend someone's license or, or their work or whatever it is pending the investigation. And, and then this, again, it, it's not an immediate reaction. You're not taking immediate action against them. You're saying, all right, I'm going to put you aside for a few days, and, and then we're going to investigate it. And then at the end, we'll be sure you get treated fairly. So this is, again, something that and then they can keep working. They can keep doing. Maybe they, they can't do that task that they were doing, but they're, they're not under that stress of having been, been penalized right away. Of course, the requirement here is you have to act very quickly. So you can't temporarily suspend them for weeks. This has to be decisions made in days. What we're talking about, of course, is, is this area here in the middle of the pyramid. Obviously, things that are intentional, negligence, that's the police's business. That's, that's not our business as safety experts. As expected conduct, if they're doing things correctly, again, we're very happy. That's what we want. And what we're trying to get is this gray area or in between the yellow and red, it would be orange and uh, between the green and the red, the orange area. So how can we find out and, and get, some, get some clarity on, on this? And this is where the fourth element comes in, which is the Just Culture Committee. But before the committee, let me give, bring another example. And this is called the blame-free postmortem. And it's an example, not from aviation, it's from the e-commerce business. And if you look at Yahoo, Google, Etsy, eBay, the big e-commerce, and, and you look at their, well, it's hidden in their policies somewhere, not so hidden, actually. It's, it's quite public. I found them very easily. They have declared policies that says, if something goes wrong, I don't care who did it. I want to find out what happened, and I want it fixed now. And it makes sense, because think about it. Your eBay, you have your shipment of something coming from China. It ends up in Bangladesh. It's supposed to be in Boston. You don't care who messed up and what code went wrong and who put the wrong number where. You want that in Boston tomorrow morning at full stop. That's all you're interested in. And this is, this is their declared policy. They say, if something goes wrong, I want everybody fixing that problem and I don't care who did it. No one's interested in who did it. Of course, afterwards, they'll unravel it and they'll figure out what went wrong and which piece of code crashed with which operating system um, or which server went down, who knows what it was. But, but they're interested first and foremost in finding out what went wrong and fixing it. And this is where the concept of a just culture committee comes in. As I mentioned, the, the purpose of a committee is if something goes wrong, there's an accident, someone makes a mistake, whatever it is, something, something is not, not as expected. You don't want one person making a decision on what the result, the consequences are going to be to the person who made the mistake. Number one, you don't want to put that pressure on one person, especially if it's the, the person's boss. Number two, in order to make a fair or a just decision, you need a group of minds thinking and discussing these things. As I mentioned with, with our little, little ongoing debate, there's actually four or five of us right now when we're, and we're exchanging thoughts of, of what the, and interpreting the rules and trying to figure out what the correct course of action is, uh, whether to penalize, and if so, on, on what grounds to, to the person, as well as, as conducting a mini investigation, looking at as many pieces of information as you can from as many perspectives as you can and coming to an informed decision. Now, I've done quite a bit of research on how these just culture committees work. And I have a list of things that, looking at variety of industries, variety of companies, what the consensus is on best practices. So what, what almost all companies will say a just culture committee should look like. One is 
very obvious, but the purpose is to learn and find corrective actions, especially regarding, as I mentioned, the system errors. So try and find out where the problems are in the system. The other is you have to have a pool of, of trained members. So these people have to be trained in accident investigation, in interview, uh, so on and so forth, and decision-making, human errors, and, and these kinds of things. And there has to be a pool because when something happens, three people will be on vacation, another will be sick, another will have a board report due tomorrow. So you have to have a pool of which you can quickly grab a few people. Obviously, the members who are the decision-making members can have no personal stake. It can't be the person's boss. It can't be the person's coworker, uh, whoever, whoever was involved, right? I, I, many of these are obvious, but it's interesting to see them, see them gathered. Now, here's one of my favorite um, technical or professional uh, definitions or, or jargons is messy details, so knowledge of the messy details. This means there has to be someone on the committee who understands the context in which the decision or the mistake was made. That means if you're in a, in a recycling plant, you need someone who understands the machinery and understands the flow of materials so that, so that they, they know if something, um, you can't throw them over the wall as, as we say in hockey, right? So they can't be fooled and led by the nose and, and they have a, a reality check. You have to have someone who, who understands the business and the context that the person who was working in makes the decision. Obviously, this means, for example, an airline, you've got to have airline pilots, you have to have cabin crew, uh, ground crew, and so on, who, who can be available to help it with the committee. I mentioned this earlier, it has to be done quickly. And, and again, this is why you have a pool so that you can, you can gather a group, three, four, five people, whatever your policy is, whatever's appropriate for your company or organization, and, and come, to, come to a resolution quickly. And then most will have a non-voting moderator, which means someone who moderates the whole process, but in the end doesn't have a vote. And I think this is again, something important. So someone who keeps the flow going, asks questions, tells someone, okay, we've already discussed that three times. We've come to a conclusion, let's leave that, so on and so forth. But in the end, they don't have a vote. And finally, very, very important is this group has to have some sort of guidance on which they can base their decisions and a decision tree. And let me show you some examples of decision trees. Don't try and, and resolve these because it's a lot of text and diagrams on, on very small drawings. I'll just, I'll tell you the, the gist or the main message from each of them. And some, again, various industries, all sorts of different things. So here's one where what they're looking for, they're trying to find out expected versus error, so expected behavior versus error and so on. They're, they're going through a variety of questions, uh, asking themselves and trying to get to the bottom of it. Here's another one, which what they're looking for is to try and decipher what was intentional and what was either negligent or just a plain simple mistake. And that's at the bottom of there. That's what they're trying to to again, ask a lot of questions and go through the various flow chart to try and get to the end of it and see if, if they just made a simple mistake, then obviously we're gonna treat them differently than if it was an intentional or a rule violation. Now here's an interesting one. And here they're looking at, you have to look at the team member and what their behavior was. And you have to look at that person's boss because very likely every poor decision has someone who was either knew about it or knew about the context. And very often there's a lack of supervision, which leads to someone making a poor decision or a mistake. So this is a very, very interesting concept. So you look first at the person who made the mistake and then you look at their boss. Here's another one. This is a rather complex one. It's, it's rather complicated to, to uh, to put into practice, but I think it's very interesting. And, and here they look at three different things. They say you have, first of all, you have a duty in your job not to cause harm, right? Then you have a duty to follow the rules and you have a duty to get the job done. And somewhere you, as, as the individual, you have to balance between these. Uh, and, and, and then they're looking at how you satisfied each of these. And then here, as our last example is ours at Budapest Airport, which we worked out. Now, I'll just say that these decision trees, there's dozens of models of these, and you really have to pick one that matches the management, the atmosphere, the environment of your company, 
and what it is you're trying to look for. And what we, what we were looking for, what we were trying to get to is where are the system errors? And we go through a whole bunch of questions and we're trying to look at, are there factors which contributed to the problem, which really the person, we can't hold them responsible for? Because there was a procedural, a training, maybe it was a position that was understaffed. Maybe there were environmental factors, physical factors that were involved. And, and so that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of, is see, go through the whole process and see what the, what the errors were behind, uh, behind the actual error or mistake or poor decision. And this is one of the ways we, we gather these, and, and I'll just show you some examples. But um, so what we try and get to is, is to find out. We ask these litmus test questions and then look at whatever contributing factors there were um, try and find the system error. And then based on those, of course, this is just a very, very simple summary, but try and find what the appropriate course of action is. And as you can see, sometimes we say, hey, you know, that was a mistake and it's unexcusable. You get the penalty. Sometimes it would be a, a, an additional training. Sometimes we say, hey, that was an infrastructure problem that caused that accident. And that's on us, the airport operator. We've got to repair that road. So again, uh, sometimes it'll be an official notification of the company because we say, hey, yeah, the person, maybe they messed up, but it was really the company's rules that, that caught, led to the error. And that's what we're trying to get at. So these are just some examples, some food for thought of, of how different companies manage this thought process. And then the counter is I looked at what are varying practices that are, are it's across the board and there's no unity on these and a couple of these are interesting ones. So for example, one question is, is the ultimate action decided by the committee or by the person's supervisor? So is the committee's decision final or do they just make a recommendation and then the person's boss makes the final decision? Um, does the committee act separately from the formal incident investigation. Now for us, we don't have the staff to and the resources to separate those. We do it together. It would be the same people anyway, but some companies, bigger companies, will have a separate just culture committee and a separate formal in investigation. Here's an interesting one. Do you want your authority to participate? And typically the answer is no way, exactly for the criminalization of error problem because as soon as the authorities, the police find out that something went wrong, they're going to want to come down and give a penalty. But interestingly, I found an example from, of all places, an African mining company that said, we want our mining authority to be on board. And if there's an accident, we want them there and we want them to buy in on whatever corrective measures we're going to take. Very interesting. Is there a possibility for appeal? Can the individual appeal the committee's decision or not? Interesting question. And then, of course, to what extent are the results publicized? Now, all, all kinds of good investigation investigations have, have great um, recommendations. Do you take something that was, that was examined so carefully at such a personal level, and do you publish them? And to what extent do you publish them? Again, these are, these, these are questions that are, are, there's all sorts of answers for these. There's no unity across the industries. What's our biggest challenge? Very, very hard to define that fine line between acceptable and non-acceptable behavior, which James Reason alluded to. Of course, we have a declared policy, and if it's in, at least this concept is in your policy, that's very important. Have a defined decision tree, a just culture committee that can work along that, that decision tree. And I think the investigators have to have this, this attitude of a, a no, no blame investigation. In the end, of course, if someone did something wrong, then it's very, could be the end result that they get the whatever penalized for whatever they did because they have to bear the consequences. But during the investigation, that should not be absolutely part of the, the mentality of the investigators. So in short, what, what my feeling of just culture is, is that when something goes wrong, and this is a message mainly to management, but just for the company culture in general, the first reaction which should be to step back, take a look at the big picture, like these two gentlemen are doing here, and, and get a, an understanding of the context of what happened, how did it happen, what were the contributing factors, what led to that poor decision or to that mistake. 
before coming down and, and penalizing. So in other words, really separating that and, and cutting uh, that line of criminalization of error and just not accepting that concept. Let me give you an example. I don't have time for too many stories, but I'll look at this, this one here. This happened in the spring of 2021. So about a year after the pandemic had hit, obviously still very, very low traffic at the airport. And what happened is at nighttime, they were towing an airplane from the maintenance base up along this taxiway, past the runway and over to the, to the terminal apron. And it so happened that our tug driver who was, who was towing the airplane came along. He had, he had received the clearance from the tower to cross the runway and proceed on the taxiway. For whatever reason, he took a wrong turn. He went onto the runway. Now, when he did that, there was an, an airplane landing in the opposite direction. So this is what's called a runway incursion in, in aviation speak. And this is a big no-no. Runway incursions are huge. And they, they made the airplane go around, the landing airplane go around. He burned another five tons of kerosene and then landed. Um, so it was, it was a no harm, no foul. But the, the driver immediately recognized, he said, whoa, something's wrong here. I'm in the wrong place. He called the tower. He said, guys, help me out. I'm, I messed up. And my first reaction, this is really funny, as a pilot, I said, so you have to know, taxiway lights are blue, runway lights are white. And I thought, how can you mix white with blue? What a dumb mistake. That was my first reaction. And then I stopped and I said, well, wait a second, wait a second, just culture. Come on, Peter, <laughs> let's get with the program. And it turned out, let me show you a picture of what an airport environment looks like at night. It's dazzling, it's lots of lights. This was probably something very similar to what he saw. Like I said, taxiway lights are blue. Here's the white runway lights. There was a green follow me light that he was following and he just got confused. And as we started investigating it, it turned out that as I mentioned, about a year after the pandemic. So he had been working at the airport for quite some time. He wasn't, he wasn't a new guy, but he hadn't done towing for quite some time. And he hadn't done nighttime towing probably for over a year. And so he had gotten thrown into a situation which he was not ready for. And to the credit of the company, of his employer, Immediately, they said, they recognized the issue and they said, all right, we're not going to penalize this guy. No way. He made a mistake. Any one of us could have made it because we put him in a situation that he wasn't ready for. And they actually came to us, to the airport operator and said, look, give us, give us five nights in the next two weeks and we're going to go out there and we're going to take all of our folks and we're going to drive around the airport with them and re-familiarize them with what it looks like at nighttime and drive all of the, the normal roads or routes that you would take, talk to, talk to the tower controller, practice getting clearances and so on. And I think this is a fantastic example of how just culture should work. So if someone makes a big mistake, runway incursion, you don't want those at all. And, and he immediately, he recognized he made the mistake. And then the company stepped back and, and took a look at all of the all of the factors that led to this and recognize that there was a problem in the system that needed to be fixed. So this is, this is a, a very positive example. Now in other industries, what does this look like outside of aviation? You'll find many, many examples in the healthcare industry. And in healthcare, obviously, especially in direct patient care, so hospitals is where, where you see a lot of efforts in just culture. Very important, I think all of us would agree if we go to a hospital, obviously we don't want someone making a mistake. If they do, we wanna make sure that that mistake gets fixed. But the healthcare, so aviation industry is what, 100 years old? Healthcare industry is 5,000 years old. There's a lot of tradition here and a lot of, of tradition of everybody holding their back for the other one and looking out for the other one and nobody can make a mistake and the doctor is everything and the nurses are nobody. It's a very, very difficult um, industry to, to make this in. Many, many, you, you see a lot of elements and I think a lot of people are working on trying to, to bring just culture into the healthcare industry, but it's very difficult. Obviously it's an enormous industry. I think the best examples come from, from the UK 
their National Health Service has a lot of studies, a lot of a lot of very, very good material, training materials and so on on this, but also at, at a number of, of, of US hospitals and, and healthcare companies. Manufacturing, hmm, not really. I don't know of too many examples, uh, but again, if someone makes a mistake, they put the weld in the wrong place, they program the, the lathe the wrong way, a lot of things can go wrong. There's a lot of human act, actions that can lead to errors. And I think you want those people treated fairly and for them to be able to feel that they can speak up. Construction, oh boy. I think if any of you work in construction industry, you know that is just uh, lots of room, uh, lots of, of errors, lots of things hidden under the table, lots of things covered up quickly so the engineer won't find it. Uh, that could use a lot of just culture and I don't think it's prevalent at all. I have found examples from, as I mentioned, forestry, power supply, mining so i think big heavy industry where they recognize the the real real danger where there's every day there's a a real um, danger of fatality then then they take it more seriously but not the construction industry and i think it's applicable really to uh, to anything which is design planning you just put the wrong number in the calculator and and you made a mistake if you're an accountant or or any any sort of engineering again people can make mistakes and they can they can lead to really bad results and and if someone makes a mistake again you want to know about it and you want to know how to fix it so it's a concept that can be applied everywhere it's not at all limited to aviation aviation is is at the forefront because it's a relatively narrow fixed uh, number of 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 things you have to do or tasks, and so I think it's a little bit easier to control, and it recognized, as I mentioned 40 years ago, the, the industry recognized the importance of, of uncovering errors and potential hazards. Okay, so just a very quick summary. Again, policy, number one, number zero, that's, that's the most important, declared policy. Have a good reporting system, make sure you can let people report anonymously, don't overburden them with ridiculous expectations. Do everything you can to stop the criminalization of errors. And, and again, you have to recognize that we're trying to create something fair in a society and a culture that eh, doesn't really give much credit to fairness, unfortunately. And finally, a committee needs to be formed that has some sort of guidance and that can come to a quick and an informed uh, an educated decision on what the what the consequences should be and how the person should be treated. And one thing I would close with here is that really all the things I've talked about in the past 40 minutes, it's just the tip of the iceberg. So there's so much more to it. Just from, I just read an article today, one of my colleagues sent me an article about, about yeah, you can have a committee and you can have great policies on your committee, but if they're not trained properly in how to, how to conduct an interview, then the person who's being interviewed is gonna have a bad taste in their mouth and they're not gonna feel like they were treated fairly. Maybe the decision is a good one, but if, if, they, if they feel like, oh, they were really mean to me, that's not gonna be a just culture or a good strong safety culture. Finally, just uh, in closing, if anyone, if I've, piqued anyone's interest and you want to do some more reading, maybe if you're a safety nerd like me, then anything by James Reason, like I said, human error, he's really master, the master of the whole concept of human error and how it comes about and what the factors are and all the contributing factors. Another gentleman, Sidney Decker, he, this, this book, Just Culture, takes you through a, a very uh, pretty nasty medical um, medical error and then the so the whole process and the lawsuits that the nurse went through and and he looks at a lot of different industries as well he, he writes some very very interesting things probably my favorite author though is a fellow named David Marks I was fortunate enough to to have a one-day seminar with David Marks attend a seminar and he takes it down to to he writes novels and he tells the whole story and Dave Subs for example is a story about a a fellow who opens a, a franchise, franchise sandwich shop and his employees make all sorts of mistakes and how he goes through the whole uh, struggling and, and trying to figure out what's, what's fair and what's not fair and how you keep people accountable, very important, 
You have to keep them accountable, but you have to treat them fairly. So they have to get the job done. And but if they make a mistake, then then they should be accountable. But you have to look at what led to the mistake. Very, very interesting. So David, David Marx is a, a very enjoyable read. And I guess I'll just close with a bit of a winter winter aviation scene for you. Uh, we don't have these kinds of runways at Budapest. In fact, we haven't seen a uh, certain, not even a flake of snow this year, but there are parts of the world that yes. And with that, I'll stop sharing and I guess Vanessa will come back. And I did get a couple of questions. And Vanessa, do you mind just asking them quickly so I don't have sure. to look for them? I can definitely do that. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, we do have a few questions. Okay. The first question, um, how do you make teammates unafraid of talking about their mistakes? Yeah, I think uh, really it's all of the things I've talked about and, and trying to, to uh, maybe I approach this a little bit more from the procedure and policy side, but as I mentioned at the end, very, very important of how you do this. So it's not just what you do, it's how you do it and how you talk to people, very, very important. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a follow-up question. So for the example of the runway incursion, a solution was proposed to provide five nights of uh, familiarization to preclude this from recurring. What happens in five years when this training is forgotten by those who took it, yet don't go out again on the taxiways at night? Was a decision made to have annual recurring training or are solutions like one time only or is there an effort to make it last? Well, I think it, it, it's only going to work if you learn the lesson and apply it. So certainly, I think that's the biggest, the biggest reason why you do incident investigations is to find out what went wrong and then make sure you change your, in this case, your training program. And one of the things we're working on, and, and a number of airports have it, is, is to develop a simulator system where you can put people in front of a simulator, just like they do at the airlines, and let them drive around the airport in poor weather and rain and fog and whatever, and, and give them more experience. But until then, take them out and, and let them see it in real life. Great, thank you. Um, could just culture apply to areas outside of safety, maybe like sexual harassment incidents or student mm -hmm. plagiarism, uh, plagiarism? Sure. Well, then again, plagiarism is an interesting one, right? Because many companies have a set of golden rules. And at Harvey Mudd, I remember there were a couple of rules. You don't cheat, you don't steal, you don't touch anybody other any, anyone else's stuff. And they told us the first day of our freshman year and everybody followed it for, for four years. So again, I think plagiarism is one, I would say that's a golden rule. Harassment, yes, because I think, I think there, there can be, there can be, you have to look at, at the context and the factors around it. That's a tough one, but sure, I think absolutely beyond safety. And like I said, just mistakes, any type of mistakes, an accounting mistake, a programming mistake. Sure. Great, thank you. How do you feel increases in monitoring, um, for example, ADSB in the US might affect the behavior of people, both likelihood of pushing limits that might result in mistakes, as well as how they might behave after making a mistake? So ADSB, for those of you who aren't, aren't pilots, is a relatively new technology where basically the FAA sees everywhere you go, they know everything about you. It's, it's like having your, you know, your cell phone turned on and your mom watching you wherever you go. And I think if things are tracked and monitored, it certainly would keep people in line. It's just like if you know there's a speed camera, you're not going to speed, right? And I think, I think that's a good tool. I don't know whether it adds to just culture or not. That's a good question. I haven't thought about that one, but uh, some of the pilots are probably thinking of an incident last year um, when someone flew under a bridge, knew she wasn't supposed to do it. The question is, did she turn her ADSB transponder off or not? Nobody knows. And since she was a very, very respected aviation writer, the whole world blew up about it. Um, I'll just leave it at that and let the pilots consider what, what their thoughts on that one are. Great, thank you. Um, and to the extent that individuals making mistakes might be held accountable, to what extent could or should the finding of guilt or innocence be separated from assessing the sentence? They, in, in, at the end of the day, I think they go hand in hand. So 
So if you've made a mistake and there's been consequences, then I think you need to be held accountable for your decision. The question is, are there other factors? And one of the things we look at when we do these is we, we, we try and find the facts. So just coming back to this little incident, we knew the driver of the car was going too fast. She crashed into another car that didn't give her the right of way. So they're both at fault, right? And then you're trying to find out what, what the factors were, but you have to look at, 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 a, at what led to those things. And so for example, people driving too fast around the terminal, it's a problem. And probably one of the contributors is that, and I, maybe I shouldn't say this in front of a big crowd, but, but we as the airport operator aren't doing enough to enforce the speed limits, right? Neither are the companies doing enough to enforce the speed limits, but maybe she was a ramp agent. She had three flights to, to manage at one time because they were understaffed. And that's why she was going fast. So I think you, you really need to look at all of the factors when you're coming. And, and that's, that's the point. If someone makes a mistake, they mess up, they cause an accident. If they, if they recognize that, then they say, yeah, okay, I deserve it. That's fine. But I want to make sure I get treated fairly and that I'm not going to get pulled over the coals unfairly, I guess. I guess that's the kind of atmosphere you're trying to, to develop in what would be a just culture. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, at this point, we don't have any more questions. Uh, do you have any last words you'd like to tell our audience before we uh, close this up? I guess there was one more question here, and it was um, talk about actions taken with those involved in the process. Uh huh. Okay. So yeah. So if a, if a controller makes a mistake, do they have to take remedial training? Does it go on the on the record? Yes. So typically, the what you're trying to get at is find the appropriate response that that will help solve the problem. And again, the the picture of the judge and the police. If you get penalized, it's not necessarily going to solve the problem. You want to find out what the root problem is. If you can help the person with more training, if you can help their team with more awareness then those might be more appropriate responses than giving them a penalty or, or, or cutting their bonus. Oh, great. Uh, Peter, we have one more question. Um, are you familiar with the YouTube aviation channel called Mentor Pilot and its series on accidents and incidents? If so, do you think the host discussion of Just Culture fit with your views? No, but I'm writing it down right now, Mentor Pilot. I, I, I'm, I don't know that one. Uh, but thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, Greg. Uh, oh, Andrew, that's Andrew's. Okay. Uh, Greg, yeah, we're, Glitch is always watching us, right? <laughs> that's right. We were always watched at Bates. So, uh, uh, and if I can just say one last thing, a huge thank you. I, I see a lot of Batesers here in the group for uh, Iris for making that happen with Howard. That was a phenomenal program. We were so privileged to be able to be a part of that. And thank you very much. And a big thank you, Vanessa, to all of your efforts in putting this program together. It's a great series, guys. I, I think there's a lot of really cool um, presentations. And, and I know you put a lot of effort into it and hold, held my hand the whole way. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter. So I want to thank Peter for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. Thank you to our audience for your questions and for attending this event. We will follow up in within the next week with a recorded video and any presentation material. So keep an eye out for future Mud Talks. If you are interested in being a Mud Talk speaker, please contact us at alumni at hmc.edu. Future events can be found on our website by visiting alumni.hmc.edu. Thanks again for joining us and have a great night or have a great day or night, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Vanessa. Bye, everyone. <laughs>